everybody video here for you today this will be a bit different i am working on a couple videos but i've run out of time today i'm leaving soon so there's those are just gonna have to wait till another day but what i thought i'd do today is upload about a four or five minute clip from all my talks my interviews i've done over the past couple of years and that's one thing i've enjoyed a lot about my youtube channel talking to other researchers so we're going to have clips today from talks with Scott Walter, Ben from Uncharted X, Charles Koss, George Howard, Brian Forrester, NEXT, the Serpent Brothers are going to be in there. And I will leave all the links for these talks below in case you have not seen one or want to check one out. So we are going to get it started off here with Scott Walter. The audio is a little rough in my first uh, clip here, but we talked about the Kensington Runestone, an artifact that seemed to have been placed. In Minnesota in the 1360s and Scott did a lot of work on it so why don't we get it started with that talk right now okay now when you did the comparative weathering study and right. and this was really important to me because I wanted to know I want to know how old the stone was because if it was modern then what was on it was really inconsequential All right. and d you actually found out that uh University of Minnesota geologist a long time ago, maybe a century ago, ended up doing yeah. the, the same study that you did, and he found it to be an old artifact. And then this he found it to be authentic, correct? And then this yeah, kind of got whitewashed. Well, yes, and, and I'm glad you brought up Newton Winchell. Uh, Newton Winchell was the first state geologist of Minnesota, um, a man that had a brilliant career. And basically, he was pulled out of retirement by the museum committee of the Minnesota Historical Society to do a forensic investigation. Now, I want to put this in context because this is really important. I mean, I knew who Newton Winchell was um, when I was in college. He is a giant in the field of geology. So I certainly knew who he was, and I knew his reputation as being um, flawless, right? But at the time I did my work, my initial work on the Kensington Runestone, I had no idea that Newt Winchell had worked on the Runestone. I knew nothing about that. And it wasn't until after I had drawn my conclusion that it was authentic based on a relative age weathering study using tombstones as my control samples that I found out that Winchell had already done some work. And I got to tell you, I, I was nervous i went oh crap yep <laughs> what hap what happens if he reached a different conclusion right i'm done is the uh, and, is the geology building is that what i remember at the university yeah, of minnesota the, named after the university him? of minnesota okay. is called winchell hall okay so we're talking about a giant in, in the field of geology that's why i was concerned initially but you know i just said well hey i just it is what it is let's go check it out so i went to the historical society and I, I went into the files and I looked at Newton Winchell's work um, and I read his report and I'll never forget when um, I found his concluding letter. And basically what he said was this, the said stone is not a modern forgery and must be accepted as a genuine record of exploration in Minnesota at the date stated in the inscription. That's exactly what he wrote, and I'll, I've memorized it. I'll never forget it. And as soon as I read that, I just sat back in my chair, and I wiped my brow, and I went, whew. Verified, <laughs> of, yeah. You know, I was like, oh, well, he came to the same conclusion. But then I thought about it, and I went, wait a minute. I had no reason to be nervous because all I did was independently replicate what he already did. And you know what? That's the way it works in science, and uh, it worked here too. Um, you know, even though I was able to replicate his work, um, we did have, you know, modern equipment. We were able to take it a little bit farther than he did, but um, I think that really underscores, you know, his correct opinion. You know, he didn't have the fancy equipment that, that we have now. But what I really want people to make sure they understand and remember. Um, there's a lot of people that want to give me credit for solving the Kensington Runestone, and that's just not true. The guy that solved the Kensington Runestone was Newt Winchell. I just came along 90 years later, and, you know, he, his, he died 
shortly after, within about five years after he wrote that that final conclusion, and people really couldn't attack his character. They couldn't attack the work, so they just marginalized him by by, by not mentioning it, right? Right. And uh, he just was sort of pushed into the shadows, and that was wrong. And I want to make sure that people don't forget who he was and the great work that he did. And he's the guy that deserves credit for solving the runestone, not me or anybody else. Next clip comes from a talk I did with Ben from Uncharted X. We talk about the Younger Dryas here. Speaking of ancient floods and stuff, the Younger Dryas, do you think, you know, where where do you think that research is going? I know you've talked to, uh, you know, Antonio Zamora and other people on your channel, which are, are great for people to hear their thoughts, but do you keep up with the current news, or how do you think uh, that's I, going to I, I try to, yeah. I uh, so I'm a I'm a um, a proponent of the of the younger Dryas impact hypothesis. I think at this point we can maybe start to move on from it being being purely a hypothesis with something like 200 plus now you know since 2005 peer reviewed papers that that provide some very solid science and and evidence for you know it, uh, basically impact proxies and this massive. You know, cataclysmic event that happened in that twelve thousand eight year um, time period in, in the Younger Dryas boundary. It's an interesting uh, whole field of research. In fact, George Howard, who's one of the guys I interviewed on my channel, is going to be in Egypt with us um, next. Or, yeah, next month now. Or, oh, yeah, really? Next, next month. Cool. Yeah. So George signed up. I'm super excited to um, to to go and spend some time with George talking about. He's he's he was one of the original authors of the first paper that that got into the Younger Dryas. And actually, I know he's working on another paper at the moment. That's a that is a I, I, I've actually I know some of the details of this, and uh, it's an incredibly interesting story. Uh, there are some clues to it in my podcast with George. Uh, if people want to go and watch that, that there's I know there's some some stuff coming out uh, in the future here that will will take this narrative a, a further step forward. But um, yeah, he's uh, George. George left a few uh, comments on my videos I did at the Younger Dryas. And yep. he is the author of the Cosmic Tusk, which yes. is all about that time frame. And I'm going to leave the link for that in the uh, video description below. So that is yes. something that uh, is pretty important. People that just kind of research that specific time period because it's something we know so little about. Exactly. Yeah. And in fact, I should have. Yeah, that's a good point to call out the Cosmic Tusk because that's the place to go if you want to. They have a, the, the Mark Young, who's a who works with George, who's a, a student in Australia, uh, did a, a lot of work. He's also a guy who authored a paper on um, on, on Graham Hancock's website. Mark Young does great work in this space, but he put together the bibliography of all of those papers and includes the ones that are skeptical, uh, of which there is not very many, and most of them have been responded to, I think, very um, uh, solidly, I guess, or, or very thoroughly. Uh, so all of those papers are on the Cosmic Tusk, and you can get links to all of them if you're interested in some of the science. And of course, Martin Sweatman has been right, has right. done a series of video reviews of all those papers, just going through the science behind it. It's just, I think there's a ton of evidence for it now, and I, it's just there's a lot. I mean, I guess it's the process. Not I'm not involved in it myself, but you know that inertial resistance to 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 mass to change like that. I don't know what it's going to take, but it seems to me like the, the the evidence is fairly overwhelming. That okay, this. This this is what happened, and it, it's the most of it really supports that idea of, you know, large cosmic impacts. That and you've got these impact proxies from all around the world, North America, South America, even South Africa now, different locations. And the the best story I, I like this part about it is that most of that evidence, particularly in North America, came from established Clovis sites and and archaeological yeah. digs because they had a, a good provenance in of strata in the Earth that went down to around that you know thirteen thousand year. Bar uh, uh, level and and so by analyzing those layers at those sites that's that's where you get all your shock synthesized nano diamonds and you know extraterrestrial platinum and iridium and all these other proxies for uh, cosmic impacts as we know it so the science is solid it's you know you've got a lot of mainstream resistance i think from archaeologists and anthropologists like guys, like hoops and 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 those guys um lots of nuance and detail and all of that too that i know i've gotten into in a few podcasts but yeah i i'm I see nothing that's uh, that's working against it at this point. And, and now that you've got some mainstream guys, uh, particularly in like South, I can't remember the name of the discovery, but but in there was a, a recent paper about South Africa. They found mm. in the Wonder Crater, they found evidence for the same thing in the same time frame. So, um, 
yeah, I mean, I, I got to imagine in the next few years we'll start to see this being a bit more younger Dry's impact versus you know younger Dry's impact hypothesis. A lot of a lot of people are becoming familiar with the idea, and for me, it wasn't like saying what exactly happened and trying to pinpoint something. It was throwing right. everything else out based on the evidence, and the impact really is the only thing that makes sense to me in the end. Yeah, yeah, that's 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 where I am with it too. It's it does, and then it has you know obviously in in my work I kind of think it also has a lot of implications for civilization, et cetera, et cetera. It's the same you know Graham Hancock talks about it in the same the same way in his in his books, but. Yeah, I, I'm in this of the same opinion. The science is going forward, and I do intend to do more uh, a, a closer look at some of that science going forward. Um, particularly, I know some of this new stuff that's coming out. I'm, I, I will be taking a closer look at. Next clip comes from a talk I did with Charles Cost last fall. I asked him about ancient Australia. He ends up talking a little bit about ancient America, and I also ask him for some book writing advice. I have not talked a lot about ancient Australia on my channel. Did you get interested in the ancient people in, in your country? Is that, I'm, I'm very curious about that. Yeah, there, there seems to be um, uh, a growing awareness of, of an ancient civilization in Australia. Um, there's, there's, there's a new author coming up. He's writing a book about this massive, uh, we have our own serpent mount here. Uh, it's been demolished by the government in the 1940s in New South Wales. And uh, it was basically, a, it's, it's a large hill and uh, with, with stones in the shape of a serpent and surrounded by geoglyphs and stones all around, kind of similar to, to what would have been in ancient America. Um, a lot of what in ancient America is destroyed, just like it's destroyed in ancient Australia. You know, if only a few mounds here and there in America and here in Australia, there are, you see mounds as well in the countryside, but you don't know what's under them. You don't know if they're, they're prehistoric or not because farmers have just tampered with them and, right, right. and ruined them. Yeah. Yep. It seems like we have a lot of different ruins in different parts of the world that all seem very similar, but they are not connected really by researchers. But man, there's a lot of similarities to ruins you see in different parts of the world. Oh, yeah. Um, it, it's true. It, it's and you can clearly see there was one culture. Like when I was at the Serpent Mound in, in America, and I saw nearby there are barrows, like you see in England. Mm -hmm. Like, wow, yeah. like round barrows. Wow, this is the same people. I'm a little jealous that you've gone to Serpent Mound and I live here and I have not yet. <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> now, uh, well, fair enough. But uh, writing books, what advice would you give to somebody who has a lot of information in their mind and maybe wants to write a book someday? Start writing. Uh, start putting it into a into a, a word file, and uh, start adding information. And just just start doing that. Add information to the file whenever you whenever you have a spare moment, or, or write it into a notebook and then transfer it. It's a lot of work to do it to keep adding information, but eventually when the, the, you get a lot of words and, and you've read a lot of other books, uh, you can you can turn it into a book and, and you just need to proofread it about a hundred times over a few months and boom, it's a book. And um, But it takes it takes a bit of time to, to get it all right and is, is, you won't see this. Yeah? Is it possible yeah. to do it in your spare time or is that something you really need to commit a lot of time to? Uh, it's, it's hard to, it's actually hard to do it in your spare time. So I had a few years off so I I, I wrote a couple of books. Uh, the reason you need to commit a lot of time to it is you need to, you, you want to read what the previous authors have said and do a bit of a, what's called a historiography in the first chapter, which is covering what the previous authors have, have talked about. So before I wrote my pyramids book, I read, you know, maybe 10, 20 pyramid books. And, and that takes a, a tremendous amount of time to do that, you know. Sure, sure. Next clip is a talk I did with Brian Forster last fall. And there are still plenty of other people I would like to interview someday. Of course, who would not want to talk to Graham or Randall? But also uh, Hugh Newman, J.J. Ainsworth, Martin Sweatman. There are a few others. Antonio Zamora, Matt from Ancient Architects. I'd like to talk to Matt someday. Even though me and Jimmy disagree, I'd like to talk to Jimmy someday. And there are a few others. The Nub Guys, Andrew. Phil, 
I'd like to do a talk with them someday because that is a mystery that I really haven't put my head around. But here is a clip from last fall, me and Brian talking about Baalbek. Now let's talk about one more place here, Baalbek. Uh. I think one of my, I think my second video I ever did was on Baalbek and I still haven't come to any good explanation of why they would carve those, what is it, 1,300 ton stones down in that quarry that are about three quarters of a mile from the temple there. Just do you have any explanation why they would use such large stones and who was actually doing that? Well, of course, uh, I've been there twice. The first time we went with a local tour guide <clears throat> who kept going on and on and on about the, the Romans building it. And, you know, you're talking 1,200, they just found one that's 1,600 tons. And they partially excavated it so you could see how big it is. And she kept going on with that. And, you know, our group was, you know, just going nuts. But uh, I've been there twice now, and you can see there are three different time periods of construction. The upper area is the Middle Ages, so it's very roughly done because they were basically turning Baalbek into a fortress to fight off the Crusaders. And mm -hmm. then below that, you have the, the Roman stuff, which is like pretty big stones, but not that tight fitting. And then you have the foundation blocks, like the Trilithon, where you have three stones in a row that are a thousand tons a piece. And it's like, you know, again, just in person, you just sort of go, oh, okay. Also, there's um, the amount of patina that's on the ancient blocks make the stones much, much um, darker than the upper upper level. So there you're talk talking about thousands of years of, of difference in terms of, of construction. So it looks like whoever was initially building uh, Baalbek made the foundation and then gave up or left or something like that. Prob again, probably cataclysm. Then 2,000 years ago, the Romans arrived. They have this beautiful foundation, so they built on top of it. And then they, they leave, and then in the Middle Ages, uh, another group come and, and build. So it's a phenomenal place. The most fortunate thing now is the first time we went, we were limited in terms of what we could see, just because they had, had a lot of it like locked away. Mm -hmm. And so the last time we went, um, our guide, Pierre, he said, what do you want to see? And I said, I only want to see megalithic construction. So with his influence, we were able to see every single megalithic block in that. And it's, you know, it's huge. And those, they are hoisted into place, right? They are on the, like the second level of construction, those 1,000 ton blocks in the Trilithon, correct? Yeah, it's either the second or maybe even the third, because they're, they're two massive, they're the, the Trilithon and then the, the base below that is huge. And then under that, quite a bit smaller. The smaller stones could have been Roman repair work, which is what you see in, in Peru, too. You see where the megalithic stuff was repaired during Inca times, like some of the foundation and things like that. But, um, yeah, Baalbek is absolutely amazing. Next clip comes from a talk I did with George Howard in March. He is the author of The Cosmic Tusk. And it was nice talking to George. I enjoyed it a lot. I've been reading The Cosmic Tusk for years. But we talked about the ancient site, a tall El Haman in Jordan seems to match up with ancient Sodom in the Bible. And something really bad happened here. It looks like a cosmic catastrophe of some sort. So here is a brief clip from that talk. All right, the subject of today, tall El Haman. I That's hope right. I said that right. Yes, now, sir. What, now, what got you uh, interested in this place in Jordan? And you went there in 2014, I believe, originally, and did archaeological work there. I think that's great. Yeah. Um, just tell how you got interested in that and why you did that research. Yeah, I went in um, 2014 and 2015. And I was actually contacted by a gentleman, um, an English gentleman, an older catastrophist, who sent me an email and said, hey, there is a dig team in Jordan that has found the largest city of the Levant, the largest city of Israel and Jordan and the Jordan Valley. And they believe that it exhibits signs of a catastrophe and a cosmic catastrophe, but they are not skilled in these determinations. Would your team be interested in talking to them? And at the same time, they, as one of those kind of coincidental things, they were also put in touch with one of the YD team um, authors and credentialed scientists, unlike myself, uh, Dr. Robert um, Hermes. At, um, I believe he's out there in New Mexico, I believe Sandia or something like that. 
And so we had two lines of communication with them that kind of bolstered each other. And the, the team leaders, um, Dr. West and Dr. Lecompte and uh, Dr. Bunch and some of the others um, evaluated uh, the opportunity to go over there and see whether we could add something to their investigation and use the forensic techniques of the YD team to perhaps um, show that the, the evidence was very strong, that there was an impact there. So I took the opportunity to be the first one over there. So in 2014, I went over there alone and dug some, you know, I did, did, did the real work of being down on my hands and knees and did that about half the time. But I was lucky because kind of the other half of the time I could go walk about, <laughs> mm -hmm. which was nice to get off your knees and, and you know, to, to, to knock the dust off. But it also meant walking alone through a lot of Bedouin fields in the Jordan Valley, which, which was an unusual experience, but one I treasure. Well, I think it's a fascinating subject. And the fact that people didn't live there for seven centuries after this horrific event happened right. were the... The bron or the Iron Age is right on top of the Bronze Age. There's no right. occupation. It just everything adds up to a pretty catastrophic event in the area. I think that's right. And then 700 years later, the first people to uh, settle back down were Moses and the Israelites. Yep. Dude, well, that amazes me. <laughs> yep. That's all. That's all debatable. But the Bible is pretty clear on these uh, locations. Yeah. And I just think this is a fascinating site, and the fact that. The high levels of heat, the directional, all the buildings fell certainly in a directional way based right. on what I've read. I mean, if a place is sacked and burned and buildings are destroyed, everything's just in a big jumble. It's not in a directional. Yeah. You know? So I just think this is a fascinating subject, and I really envy you for going there and digging an archaeological site and sharing the pics with me. I'm going to share these at the end, and I'll show that burnt layer and a few of the other things we talked about. I just learned a whole bunch on this, George, and I really appreciate it. Well, Chuck, I'm glad you're um, um, publicizing it and popularizing it because um, um, Tell All a Mom has gotten a significant amount of attention. But to anybody that gets fascinated about this, it doesn't seem like enough. Next clip comes from a swap cast I did with Ben from Uncharted X and Brothers of the Serpent, the Mountain of the West, investigating the Middle Pyramid of Giza. And this clip, they are going into the internal chamber in here. This is pretty interesting. And we all uploaded this, so I will leave all three links I below. I cut myself out of these damn footages, but you can get a sense of the height of the tunnel. <laughs> the audio also screws up a bit here. I don't know why the microphone on the thing wasn't, it sort of drops in and out a little bit here. I'd like to get a snapshot of that for, for measuring. <laughs> Belzoni. Belzoni. <laughs> Yeah, so in the chamber. So yeah, Belzoni discovered this. This is the uh, the A-frame ceiling uh, of the, the chamber that's in here. The granite box is down the end. And you also have the only thing that's not, um, there's not bedrock in here is the ceiling. And the ceiling has an A-frame ceiling. Uh, you'll see it up high. It has... Uh, and this is the fine, uh, the Tura limestone. Again, this is the, the limestone that has been brought in from uh, a, a quarry that's a distance from Giza. I'm not sure how far, but uh, that's you'll see that in the ceiling here. The front chamber is covered in the bedrock, except for the ceiling. Yeah. The ceiling only is covered. The Tura limestone. And it looks like cement. No, it's limestone. That's a good comment. Like Henry says, it looks like cement. Like that's how it looks like a modern cement job. But nope, yeah. it's, that's however many thousands of years old fine yeah. tour of white limestone. Like the casing stone. Very finely joined, yeah. Hmm. It's a cool space. This was only the, the second time I had the chance to be oh, in here box. on this trip. Ben, I know you've been to the pyramid, I think, of Unis or Wenus. Wenus, yeah. Is that, yeah, is that chamber in there kind of similar to those smaller pyramid chambers as, as far as their, what they look like the, with that ceiling and stuff? There's, there's an A-frame ceiling in there, I think, yes. I think it is an A-frame. 
uh, I think. And we can look at Winnie's. I've been in there a couple times. I'm just trying to think from memory if it has the A-frame ceiling. But that uh, kind of reminds me of those, what you find under the pyramid of Teddy and Unis and Pepe and those people, the smaller pyramids. Yeah, the, the, with, that, with that ceiling, yeah. So it looks like they, uh, they tiled around the, or, you know, put stones around the uh, box there. Yeah, it's, it's kind of built into the floor. The, 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 it actually sits a little lower than floor level. And then, then they did build up around it in granite. So you have the, the box here with its lid, which is pretty fine work. There's actually, and a real nice drill hole. A couple, the, the tube drill holes, you can see the striations uh, on these. Um, you can also, they're actually, we just, I didn't realize this until the, the last day on the tour, we came in here again. Uh, there's also tube drill holes on the underside of the lid. So maybe it was doweled into play, or there might have been something to, like a pin. I'm not, yeah. I think it looked to, to the eye like it lined up. Is there a Jimmy, lip on the underside of the lid? It looked like, yeah, it looked like there was a lip. Unless that was the support that's holding it up. Uh, I, and it looks like there's a lip on the inner edge of the box there, yeah. too. Yeah, uh, there, it might be a little, looks like a little lip. Let's see if I can just go back here. Just here. Yeah, when you're, yeah there's a lip there. And, it, and when you were walk, sort of walking up and looking straight at the, the lid, you could see what looked like a... Uh, Back up a you bit. Could see sort of under it. And look like, yeah, see that? Or is that the board, the support that's holding that it? Uh, I think no. I think I think there. I think you're right. I think that is a that is a that is a lip. Yeah. Yeah. So it's yeah. Sits yeah it, down it sits. It side. pops down in there. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. Final clip comes from a talk I did with NEXT at Caesar's Palace about a month ago, and I know a lot of you have seen some of these videos already, but maybe there's one clip in here from a video you have not seen so that's kind of the purpose of this once again all these links will be left below for the full video but it was nice hanging out with him for a couple hours about a month ago we talked about life ancient history a lot of different things and he is on a tour of ancient america right now so if that is something that interests you you should sub his channel i'm sure he will have a lot of good videos coming from ancient america in the near future but here is that brief clip, and I hope you enjoyed this video, and you all have a very nice day. Yeah, just really putting science to it. And so a lot of these sites have been measured, and we know that there's different aspects to the site that bring about these different um, energies. And, you know, again, some people might be like, oh, he's talking energy, this is woo-woo. But I've watched grown men come out of the chapel of Sekhmet in tears. I've watched non-believers walk into that shrine and walk out deeply moved. And I've had amazing experiences there. So for me, that's like the most potent place in all of Egypt. Yeah, I've done a, I did a video a long time ago on the magnetite in your brain and how certain stone chambers would affect that. And they say that the magnetite, you have billions of these little cells, crystal cells in your brain, and they say that affects your pineal gland. Right. So I wonder if there's a connection, and they knew something a long time ago that, like the uh, Great Pyramid's King's Chamber is in some sort of something right. that's supposed to reset your mind or something like that. Right, and then, I mean, you have that effect with crystals and quartz and, and you know, a lot of the natural elements that we find around the sites. You know, there's, there's a lot of different ideas about how these mysteries could be resolved. You know, you have ancient, say, ancient high technology. John Anthony West actually would explain this beautifully. There's, there's four different um, ways to explain some of the anomalies at these ancient sites. And it could be a high technology, like the work that Chris Dunn has really uh, pioneered and brought to the forefront. And, you know, others now, it's become a very popular, um, a very popular subject on YouTube. Shout out to Bennett, Uncharted X has done a bunch of amazing videos on this. Then you have what could be a soft technology, which may be something that's right under our noses, something that's more natural and organic, um, sound, acoustics, water. You know, there's a lot of theories out there. There's endless theories, but I don't think anyone has it quite right yet. It feels like we're still missing some pieces. Yes. Definitely. Why? I can't say. Maybe it has to do with the astrological, you know, the, the celestial cycles and long period cycles and the way that that affects humanity. If you think of it in the, you know, even the moon has an effect on water. We're mostly comprised of water. There's a lot more going on. You know, there's an influence from the celestial fears. This is all well documented in Egypt. 
in the Dendera temple by the Ptolemaic Egyptians who have it all on the ceiling. And it would just seem this, you know, these understandings, the ancient religions and ontology, it seemed to be a universal thing. So we find a lot of the same parallels and similarities in Egypt, in Mexico, even here in the States. And that's why I'm excited about, you know, this upcoming trip to ancient America. But also now that we're, you know, last year we postponed our COVID trip. Every year I do an annual tour with Adept Expeditions. Actually, sometimes we do several tours a year. We postponed it because of the pandemic, but this year I'm really excited about going back with Chris Dunn, by the way. How many more times are we gonna see Chris Dunn in Egypt? I can't say with certainty, but it's an honor and a privilege to be traveling with Christopher Dunn, you know, co-leading that tour where I typically do my esoteric Egypt tour. So we have the sacred science, we have the symbolism, we have Western esoteric concepts and, and you know, and how that parallels Egypt and how it's derivative, it comes out of Egypt. The mystery schools have their roots in ancient Egypt. But then we also have Chris Dunn there in the field to explain and not just explain like we see on YouTube, but explain from 50 years experience you know, in his profession, there's not many people that can, you know, that were approaching Egypt in this way. And when an engineer like Chris Dunn comes to Egypt and sees these anomalies, we have to take that into consideration. Right. Egyptology is important. I don't want to just, you know, dismiss it all as quackademia. I find so much value in the academic text. I find more value yeah. in a lot of the academic text than I do in about 90% of the alternative space. But I think both sides are both very important and instrumental in, in really trying to understand the bigger picture. 